What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. This episode is going to be a little different from our usual homebrew brew days or our pro brewer interviews. This is about something that we don't talk about a whole lot in homebrewing and homebrewing circles, and that's our health. It's almost a little weird to say it out loud as I set up this video. It's a presentation from Homebrew Con 2021 co-presented here on Chop and Brew with uh, support from American Homebrewers Association, and it's called Healthy Hacks for Homebrewers. Now, I was pretty surprised when I saw this pop up on the seminar rundown last summer, but I, I watched it and I was very encouraged, A, I was inspired, and I was just happy to kind of see this discussion uh, in the mix with all the other seminars. However, I didn't really act on it and just went about my way living life how I've been living life for a long time. Fast forward to last fall, some health uh, situations arose for me in which I, it was very clear I needed to revise and reevaluate my relationship with beer, food, exercise, the whole big circle to start leading a little bit better life. And a light, light bulb went off and I was like, oh, healthy hacks for homebrew. So I went back and watched it again. And it's literally become part of the roadmap of kind of some of the changes I'm trying to make in my life. That being said, this is not the be all end all presentation on life hobby balance, weight loss, just kind of getting into a healthier state of mind and state of body. This is just one homebrewer's journey shared to help anyone else who might feel like they want or need it. That one homebrewer is Travis Hammond of the Quaff Homebrew Club in San Diego. After years of brewing and beer drinking, Travis found himself at a crossroads and decided to make some important changes. His presentation looks at some of the things that helped him prioritize his health while also enjoying what we all love so much. Great beer, home brewing, good times with good friends. He shares some of what he's learned about exercise, diet, and of course, alcohol intake, what works for him, and admittedly, where he still struggles. Again, I got to emphasize here, neither Travis nor I are doctors, dietitians, or therapists. What works for one person does not necessarily work for all. So please, if the ideas and concepts discussed here encourage you to make changes in your life, see a doctor or another professional to build a plan. That being said, I really appreciate Travis for uh, sharing his experience. I admire the AHA for putting this in a homebrew contract last year. Um, it's something we all think about. I know we all think about it, but we don't talk about it a lot. We don't share a lot about it. It's kind of taboo almost, I feel like. And I know from personal experience how easy it is to, over the years, get over-obsessed and kind of lost in homebrewing, craft beer, especially if you're in the industry of either of both of those things. So um, perhaps I'll share some of my own situation in future videos. But for now, I'm going to pass the mic to Travis Hammond, co-presented by the American Homebrewers Association, Healthy Hacks for Homebrewers. Thanks to the fellow homebrewers out there who encouraged me to put this um, talk together um, to the AHA conference for um, including it in the, in the presentations. And to all of you guys who are willing to talk about a few things that we don't normally talk about at homebrew events. Um, my talk today is meant to be both a cautionary tale for you new homebrew, homebrewers out there and a bit of hope for uh, those of you who are currently obsessed with homebrewing uh, and trying to balance the hobby with your health. I can't see who's on and uh, who's not. So for those of you who may not know me, um, I want to talk about uh, who I am and why I'm here talking about healthy hacks for homebrewers. Um, I started Extract Brewing in 1994, back when I lived in Boulder, Colorado, um, and then I moved to San Diego in 2001 and didn't brew very much from 2001 to 2007 uh, as I was living in smaller apartments. But I was about 215 pounds when I moved here, and uh, but I was traveling for work a lot, staying in hotels, um, eating out all the time, and I managed to put on about 10 pounds in three years. So here's a shot from the Hofbrau House in Las Vegas from about 2004. In 2007, I took a break from playing ice hockey. About the same time, I moved to a house with a two-car brewery, got back into home brewing, and started uh, barbecuing as a new hobby at the same time, which led to about a, another 10-pound gain in two years. And you can see here in this photo from a beer fest in 2009 in a tight 2XL uh, shirt. 
um, I found myself in this, uh, you know, new world of flavor, learning to judge uh, beer styles, unlimited ability to create tasty beverages in my own garage, um, surrounded by other great brewers here with Quaff, who also happen to be great cooks and cheese makers, multiple bottle shares, brewery events, club meetings, campouts, beer festivals, pretty much every day. And so I pretty much got lost in the hobby. Um, I ended up um, becoming a uh, beer uh, mead and cider judge over a few years. I taught BJCB classes, ran exams, competed, and won some homebrew awards, served as a BJCB West rep for a while, and eventually became a grandmaster BJCB judge. Um, and probably the most memorable thing about that part of my homebrew career was I've been at every NHC slash homebrew con since 2010, back in Minnesota, the first time I went up there. I'm not trying to brag here. For those of you who don't know me, I'm going to try to be humble, but I was just just showing you my homebrew obsession, and I was just an old Boy Scout trying to earn all the homebrew merit badges. Um, and beer became part of my identity, and I wonder if it has for some of you too. But this picture here after um, NHC 2016 in Baltimore, I was the heaviest I'd ever been, um, 255 pounds. And there I am in a tight 2XL uh disneyland churro shirt shout out to the ears up podcast folks um i was in the morbidly obese bmi range and my doctor had sa said that i had made foie gras of my liver creating some extra fatty deposits in there they were throwing my enzymes out of whack and i knew i needed to change um, a couple months after returning from nhc my previous relationship ended and i found myself with a lot more time to focus on myself and quite frankly needing some distraction so I focused on learning to cook healthy options for myself and getting some exercise. I ended up dropping 10 pounds in a month and it was a huge motivator to keep going. Um, I lost 60 pounds between NHC 2016 and NHC 2017. Um, here I am in April 2017 wearing a size XL or large shirt and enjoying a few beers uh, at the Burning Beard anniversary party um, while stabilizing for a couple months on my 200 pound weight loss plateau. I hit my 180 pound goal weight in October, 2017, and I've pretty much maintained plus or five pounds since. So here's a photo from February, 2020, um, in my new size large churro shirt with a little bit extra room on it. I'm smiling because I know I can enjoy some beer and some treats and balance it all out. Um, I still brew, I still uh, make mead and cider, I still put on BJCP exams, I still enter competitions, um, I still judge competitions, still visit as breweries, as many breweries as I can, um, but I've mostly figured out how to keep it under control. I'm not trying to preach to anyone or push anyone to change, believe me, I'm not a picture of, you know, role model of health, but um, I feel a lot better than I used to. Um, if you're happy the way you are, I really hope you stay that way, but if you're considering making some changes, I hope what I learned and what I share with you here today will help make it a little easier on you. So what are we gonna talk about? Um, the underlying message here is how to balance uh, the lo our love of homebrewing with our health. Um, I believe that the things that make tend to make you a good homebrewer, like curiosity, commitment, willingness to experiment, will also help you on the road to other goals you set for yourself. I know that we'll just be getting the conversation started here today but I hope that we continue to talk about these things more openly in the future. Um, it's important to know that I'm not a doctor, nutritionist, or an expert. I'm just another home brewer who learned these lessons the hard way. Everyone's different and what worked for me may not work for you. So why did I title my talk Healthy Hacks? Um, uh, hacks are, of course, shortcuts, tricks, secrets, that can help get you some desired results in the shortest amount of time. Um, and I wanna make it as easy as possible um, for you guys to see some quick results and be encouraged to continue. Um, to make the most of the virtual meeting environment, keep an eye out for red text in my slides. That's sort of a cue for you to um, put some stuff in the chat and then I'll probably look over there and see what uh, what you guys are talking about because I, I can't see it while I'm presenting, apologize. Um, Okay, and hopefully you guys got some good jokes in there and can have some fun. Um, so here's a few slides about the early part of my journey. So you can see how I got started and then we'll tie this all back into home brewing a little bit. Um, but before we get into what did work for me, I wanted to talk a little about the, about the things that I knew would not work for me because that was always my excuse back in the day. I, I knew what wouldn't work for me. Um, 
in 2016, at that point, I was too busy to spend much time, you know, working out. My uh, job was busy and traveling. Um, I also found that exercise tended to make me hungrier, and I would, you know, more likely overeat as a reward for the sweating I did that day. Um, so I kind of didn't focus on exercise. I also knew from previous attempts to lose weight that I didn't have the discipline to, you know, track calories, um, macronutrients, follow Weight Watcher points, or you know, journal everything that I ate or um, record everything in a notebook or on an app. Um, I just wasn't going to do that type of a thing. I know it works for some people, and I encourage you to give it a try if you think it will work for you. Um, I didn't want to be distracted with hunger either. I was hoping that there was a way that I could uh, learn to lose weight without uh, constantly feeling like I was depriving myself and being distracted from, you know, the things I needed to focus on. I didn't want to stop enjoying life. You know, we had some great get togethers going with friends and I didn't want to miss out on that. So what options are left? Well, I'll tell you how I got started. Um, most of plan changes in life, I seem to find, you know, like learning to homebrew or improving your homebrewing, you know, tend to happen in a cycle. Um, first you, you know, begin to believe a change or become interested in making a change and believe that it's possible and you make a decision to do something different or learn something new, and your cycle begins. Um, then you go get some knowledge, learn some skills, improve your existing skills, put in some new habits into practice, measure results. Um, and uh, to complete the cycle, you evaluate your progress towards your goal, you adjust your approach, and you repeat the cycle, but at a higher level than before. And of course, your cycle may not follow that specific order, and it's never quite that neat and uh, orderly. Um, for me, I uh, wanted to change, and I heard about a system of diet and exercise that was having some long-term success for people, people like me who were looking to lose 50 pounds or more. Um, the system's described in the book, The 4-Hour Body, by Tim Ferriss, and I actually just listened to the podcast, or I'm sorry, to the uh, audiobook repeatedly, you know, while doing housework or less intense, like, homebrew work, until I kind of understood the basics. Um, joined some Facebook groups that had to do with it and um, saw it working for some other folks. Um, and I began, yeah, began to believe that I could do it too and started my own cycle. Um, clicked ahead here a little bit, but as an engineer and project manager, I wanted some data to evaluate. So the first thing I did was I bought this digital scale. Um, at that time, it was about 50 bucks on Amazon. And then it gives you, you know, body weight, uh, body weight, uh, body fat, that type of thing. And I just simply recorded my weight every day on a sticky note, kept it real simple. Um, just the date, the time of my recording, which was important, the weight. And then if I saw some fluctuations, I'd like to make a little note about what may or may not have caused that. And in that way, I, um, you know, start thinking about the direction of my trend, as well as what is causing those fluctuations. And then just put that in the back of my mind and get on with my day. And, you know, I found it was uh, useful to start to understand what was happening. Um, today, there's a, a lot more advanced Bluetooth or Wi-Fi scales that link automatically to an app um, and help you track your progress for you. Um, it's kind of a key point of the presentation here that um, a lot of people say this daily weighing, recording, and evaluating process is like one of the most important things you can do if you're going to make this type of a change um, to really understand your situation and get control. You know, you need to know which way you're heading and act accordingly. Um, a few words of caution, though. You know, weight is just sort of a proxy variable for tracking your overall health progress. It's, you know, it's just easily measured. Um, it represents a lot of other things. Um, it can go up and down dramatically each day, depending on what happened. Um, water weighs, you know, eight pounds per gallon or about a pound per pint. So I'd find if I ate, you know, movie theater popcorn with lots of salt the day before, I could go up two pounds the next morning due to stored water. Likewise, if I'm hungover and dehydrated, I find that I can drop two pounds in a day. Um, the actual number isn't as important as the direction of the trend and the thinking about what may have caused those fluctuations, to kind of understand your situation. Um, People have cautioned me, too, to put in here that, you know, it may not be good for people with a, an eating disorder to pay this much much close attention to your weight, um, to the number on the scale. If, it, if that's any of you, you know, seek advice from somebody more qualified than me, um, please, before you do any of this. 
Um, next up, I purged the house of the junk food. I got rid of all the ice cream, the candy, and any other food that I can't resist when I have a little bit of a buzz going. Um, just got some better options there. Um, I learned uh, through the internet, I highly recommend this dietdoctor.com, um, sort of a nonprofit, talks about better, healthier snacks, great visual food guides. And I went to, to the store and stocked up on some of those healthier options. Really learned to love them now. It's kind of my, my go-to. Um, just a quick zoom in here. This is my actual weight loss spreadsheet and a little chart of the drop. Um, okay, just a quick zoom in on that. But looking back now, um, I can see that perhaps the single most important change that I made um, wasn't really diet or exercise related, but it was the mental changes that started about six months earlier um, when uh, I began to learn to meditate. And so in keeping with the theme of things we don't usually discuss at homebrew meetings, <laughs> um, I understand if you're skeptical or have an aversion to the idea of meditation, I used to as well. Um, and I'm guessing you weren't expecting to hear this today, but I, I believe it was the most important change that enabled all the other changes for me to occur. Um, and the truth is, I was, I was sort of pushed into meditation. I've mentioned the busyness at work, but my, my job had, you know, demanding clients, multiple tight deadlines. I didn't have much of a support team to help me out. And I was getting to the point where I was either going to walk away from a good career or I needed to find a better way to get through it. I was pretty desperate and I needed some sort of um, portable calm to take with me to kind of help handle the work stress. And... Um, at the time, you know, all the podcasts I listened to, people like Sam Harris and Tim Ferriss also, you know, they were talking about the value of developing this mental awareness. And, you know, these were people I respected, um, you know, through having this meditation practice. And so, you know, eventually you hear enough people talk about it. I it was interested enough to give it a try. So in the interest of giving you guys some actionable steps you can take following this talk today, I got started using um, uh, the Headspace app. Um, I did their free... 10-day trial. It's called Take 10. And it's just basically 10 beginner lessons. They're 10 to 15 minutes each, and they introduce some of the concepts of meditation, uh, like following your breath or doing body scans in a very user-friendly way. Make it a homework assignment after this to check that out. Give it a try. And I can see clearly now that that understanding my mind helped me um, really plant the seeds to begin taking control and making the changes I did with my body. So just one slide quickly on some mindfulness lessons, and then we'll get back to the, uh, the homebrewing discussion. Um, mindfulness is a lifelong journey, of course, and the results can be profound for people. Um, but let me just summarize a few of the things I learned and how they relate to your overall health. Um, and I'll try to tie the two together here. Um, lesson one, simple is not the same as easy. You know, I, for homebrewing, a decoction mash is a simple concept, but it's not very easy to execute well. You know, there's a lot of details you need to know there. Um, some may argue it's easy after having done it a few times, but you get the point. <laughs> um, focusing on your breath is simple, but thoughts and emotions, sensations, feelings, um, things like hunger will arise and uh, take your attention away from your breath. Um, so it's not really easy to truly focus on your breath for more than a, a few breaths in a row. Lesson two, there's a brief moment between stimulus and response. And with practice, you can use those brief moments to evaluate your options and choose a more thoughtful response to the stimulus rather than allowing a mindless sort of knee-jerk reaction. You know, touching a hot boil kettle, simple type of stimulus, of course, from the heat, brings an instantaneous, you know, reaction of you pulling your hand back. But a more complicated stimulus, like a harsh comment from your boss or your partner, uh, you know, make, may call for a more skillful response. And so you'll make sure that you learn how to choose those response uh, wisely rather than have an instantaneous reaction. Lesson four, beginning again, and this one ties in quite a bit here today. If you make a bad batch of beer, it doesn't mean you're not a good brewer. You learn from your mistakes, you try the same recipe again. Likewise, if you're meditating, you find yourself lost in thought when you're trying to be following your breath. It doesn't mean you're not good at meditation just means you're a human with a typical busy mind. Um, you acknowledge that you lost focus and then you just start again, begin your focus over on your breath. In a similar way, if you make a regrettable mistake on your journey to better health, 
just be kind to yourself rather than critical, acknowledge the mistake, and then recommit yourself and start your health journey again. Finally, uh, take a minute to think about the other people in your life who might benefit from you being, you know, a little calmer, a little less anxious, a little less reactive. You know, mindfulness is a gift you can give the people around you too. Okay, so enough about meditation, but I have to emphasize how important that step was for me in believing I could make and sustain some changes. So early on, you know, <laughs> most serious people all agree, simple fact that losing weight is about balancing your diet and exercise. Does that really surprise anybody? Um, hopefully not. But let me see if I can uh, present this idea in a little bit more helpful way. There's, there's tons of controversy out there in the world of diet and exercise, lots of contradictory information, no clear consensus on the best you know, approach. You think of all the diets you've heard of, um, paleo diet, caveman, keto, Atkins, gluten-free, low carb, whatever, you know, grapefruit diet. I heard there was an ice cream diet. Um, or all the exercise fads, you know, Bowflex, boot camps, I'm dating myself with Bowflex, right? CrossFit, Peloton, or uh, let me see here, uh, that crazy uh, contraption there at the lower right, uh, $14,000 in the bottom of, uh, or at, in Sky Mall. You guys remember Sky Mall up in the uh, airplanes? Gets you shredded in just four minutes a day. So where, where do you start? Um, personally, I estimate that 90% of my weight loss was done in the kitchen, not the gym. Like I said, I didn't have a lot of time to exercise. So I learned, I went the other way and learned to control my calorie intake. Um, I heard a quote along the way that I like, um, said, you can't outrun an eating problem. And I found that to be true for me. But the balance of diet and exercise, you know, for you may be totally different than for me. You know, it can be sort of a massive, you know, tug of war type balance where you're carb loading and then running marathons. Um, or it could be a more delicate balance, you know, like a seesaw where you're trying to eat healthy, limiting the big numbers of, you know, mistakes you make and getting a little exercise here and there. You know, the balance could be different for each of you. I hope you all understand that too. Likewise with beer, you know, your favorite beers might be big, rich, sweet, malty beers that uh, use, you know, some alcohol and some Belgian yeast character to balance the sweetness out. Or you may prefer the subtle Pilsner malt flavor in a Hellas, balanced with just enough delicate hop bitterness to counter. Um, but whichever balance you prefer, we all understand that the best beers we've had achieve some sort of balance. Um, but those beers can be greatly different from each other. Another opportunity for mindfulness here, keeping you know awareness of your mental state, is when you're presented with some tasty options. Um, I always try to ask myself if the the joy that I'm going to get from consuming this this something is, uh, you know, worth taking in the calories. Um, and I say that because I, I've made a mental shift where I am now committed to, you know, balancing that out. So when you commit to making a change in your health or staying where you're at, not backsliding, um, you can eat whatever you, you're going to enjoy as long as you promise yourself that you're going to balance those calories out later. Um, and that means either getting to the gym and sweating it off, um, or being really disciplined about what you eat until it balances out. Um, whichever way you are, though, be honest with yourself. I mean, how much work, you know, are you willing to uh, put in to balance out that bland, you know, grocery store birthday cake that somebody brought to the office? Um, now, if your grandma made her famous apple pie, don't you dare miss out on a slice. Just be sure to make it up to yourself later. Um, I'm going to pick on Imperial Stout here quite a bit today. But, uh, you know, a 19% ABV Imperial Stout with lots of residual sugar, can have up to 50 calories per ounce. That's why it takes 10 people to drink one of these big bottles of uh, the Abyss or uh, Black Tuesday. Um, 1,250 calories per 750 mil bottle. So if you wanted to exercise that many calories off, you'd have to run 80 minutes continuously at a moderate intensity or do 80 minutes of high intensity like elliptical training or riding a bike or something like that. That's a lot of effort. Now, during the pandemic, I have to admit that I decided to pare down my beer cellar, and I sipped my way through one of these Black Tuesdays of 2015 by myself <laughs> on a Tuesday night, 19% ABV. Uh, sounded like a good idea at the time, <laughs> but I woke up with a headache, and I had to just acknowledge the mistake, simply start again, 
probably with a couple of dry days to help me get back down where I was before that splurge. So, so here's some um, fairly common knowledge tips um, that you, many you may have even heard. Uh, we'll go into more detail about some of these on subsequent slides. Of course, you know, and I understand if uh, they decide to mute my mic here after saying this, but you know, when you're getting started on a weight loss program, avoiding alcohol during the early stages will help maximize your weight loss. And I'll tell you why that is here in a few slides. And it, it, you know, the surprising reason for that here in a little bit, um, something I didn't know until I started this. Um, but hopefully that promise of your initial sort of sharp weight drop will be enough motivating factor for you guys to, you know, make that temporary sacrifice. Um, before you really get going on your journey too far, I'd, I'd advise knowing where you're heading um, and setting a, an end goal weight where you're going to try to remain. Um, for me, I, I'd suggest shooting for the upper end of the normal BMI uh, weight range for your height. You know, it's a it's a decent goal. Um, get you better health insurance uh, uh, rates. <laughs> But you're making a deal with yourself. So when you get to that goal, you have to learn to relax and enjoy your success and stop freaking out and stop worrying so much. And you're not going to try to get that extra 10 pounds and be that person that's constantly worried about this stuff. You're just going to get to your goal. You're going to maintain. And then also, you know, set your uh, your guardrails, I call them. And that's the um, the upper, you know, I recommend uh, about five pounds over your goal weight. And when you hit that five pound guardrail, you know, during the holidays or vacation or whatever, it's just time to take some evasive maneuvers and get back to your target. Oh, make sure you stabilize your weight after about every 10% weight loss. So for a 250 pound uh, person, you'd wanna, you know, lose 25 pounds and then stabilize at that two, 225 pound weight for a little while. Um, it's nice to work hard for a goal, stay focused, and then get there and enjoy your success. Um, prove to yourself that you can maintain that level, buy some new clothes, um, and commit yourself to the next increment. Um, they say it also helps your body's hormones stabilize, so your body isn't fighting against you so much, against the weight loss, as you go to the next um, uh, loss period. Um, you know, otherwise, your body can adjust your metabolism, and you can find your, you know, you're being fought by your own body. Take your time. Everybody says this. Take your time when you're eating or you know, drinking, spread your meals out over half an hour and savor each bite. Um, that helps flatten out your blood sugar curve. Something that we'll talk a little bit more here about. Um, mindful drinking is another thing that I'm sort of learning about now, um, but it's more where you really focus on savoring the, the sight, the aroma, the taste, and the texture. You know, paying attention to your beer, um, seeing how it changes in your mouth, what's the, you know, what's the temperature, Watch as the flavors pass, and then have a little sip of water in between. You know, take a break. Appreciate the next step. Sip the same way um, as if it was your first. I tend to be pretty bad at this, but I do try to do it when I think about it. So I, I just wanted to go through a quick, you know, you see the red text there, that that um, little exercise here where we take a few mindful sips together. So if you all have your your beers handy, hopefully, um, take a good look at it. Does it look familiar to you? You had this beer before? Or is this a beer you're just getting to know? Think about your state of mind here. Are you ready to enjoy this beer? You realize how lucky you are to be able to enjoy this beer right now, sitting here on a Saturday on an internet meeting? Does the glass feel heavy in your hand? A little bit more mindfulness here. So now, what noises can you hear nearby? Any humming of the refrigerator? Or whirling of the ceiling fan? Any noises you hear further away? Well, the thing about mindfulness is all of those things, all of these things that we're talking about were here, but you weren't looking for them. But they were here before you were looking for them, so they didn't come to your mind. It's an important lesson. Now, smell your beer. Not talking about evaluating it here. I know there's a lot of beer judges probably on here, but you know, not like for a competition, but put everything else aside and just experience it. Is it fresh, inviting? Does it bring up some memories or take you to another place? All right, take a sip. How often do you think about the temperature of the beer as it hits your mouth? What flavors jump out up front? The light bodied or full bodied? What flavors tend to reveal themselves, you know, right before you swallow? Was it refreshing? All right, now let those flavors fade. 
see how they change. When the flavor's gone, take yourself a sip of water. And prepare yourself for the next mindful sip. Now we went through that pretty quick, but you can have your own version of that, however it is. But following a process like that, you'll see there's a lot more to appreciate in beers. Even lighter beers um, can be appreciated in this way. All right, so some specifics here, and I'm going to go through this pretty quick because anybody that's really interested in it can go look this up. You know, you choose whatever method of um, getting started that you think will work for you. I chose um, to follow, like I said, the four-hour body they have in there called the slow-carb diet where you're trying to get rid of, you know, sugars and starches in favor of things like beans um, or complex carbs, um, just to kind of be able to help you down the road to making changes. Um, I thought, you know, uh, that the change was going to be hard for me. I, I knew I was going to have to give up some things that I love. So I wanted it to be simple. And I found these guidelines to be relatively small changes for me um, and relatively easy to stick with. So that said, here's the, here's the rules of the slow carb diet or the recommendations, I guess. They recommend eating 30 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking. For me, that was three eggs in the morning, which seems like a lot if you're not a breakfast person, but it helps decrease your level of hunger all day long. So you're better able to control your eating for the rest of the day. Of course, avoid drinking calories unless they're worth it. So be selective about which calories you're drinking. Um, you have to be willing to earn those uh, calories through exercise or eating well. Otherwise, drink water, you know, sparkling flavored water, unsweetened tea, coffee, but no juice, no, no soda. Sorry, those calories are just too easily absorbed and they don't fill you up. They're not helpful if you're going to try to lose weight. Um, of course, avoid sugar and white carbohydrates. That's like every diet you've probably ever heard. Um, those things are so easily absorbed by your body and they're very calorically dense. So a small amount of them um, packs a punch. Um, also, avoid eating fruit which can be tasty and added back later when you hit your goal, um, but it's not helpful during the period where you're trying to lose weight. Um, they recommend eating the same few healthy meals over and over again. And I find that, you know, especially breakfast and lunch, um, you'll get better at making those types of meals, um, save some time there, make a big batch of something and, um, you know, spread it out over the week. I, I like making a big batch of, you know, egg whites and onions and spinach scramble and then put different hot sauces on it as I eat it through the week. Um, Take one treat day off a week. This is where you basically say to yourself, look, Saturday, when I'm out, I'm going to go and have whatever it is I want to eat and drink. And it helps, again, reset those hormones for the week. And you feel like you're not depriving yourself of anything. Um, but then there's ways to learn to minimize the impacts of those treat days on your overall goal. So that's the rules. Um, one other concept they talk about in the uh, four-hour body that I think is worth talking about here is... Um, the uh, minimum effective dose of exercise. So when doctors are prescribing medicine, you know, they apply this concept of minimum effective dose. You know, if they can get 90% of the desired results with, you know, 100 milligrams of some particular drug, they're not going to give that patient you know, 200 milligrams of the drug to get that extra 10% of the results. And I'd encourage you guys to do the same. Um, sometimes doing more may not necessarily um, give you proportional results. Um, so some of the things that I found uh, to help during the weight loss phase was I learned some enhanced fat burning methods. And there's three things that I found that really work well for that. Um, one, which I hadn't heard before all this, was exercising in the morning after sort of fasting from the night before. Um, so most of the carbs and, and sugars are out of your body. And it forces your body to go into fat burning mode and use your stored fat as an energy source rather than sugar from some recent meal. So. Um, it's an easy way to kickstart in uh, the fat burning. Uh, of course, if you have more time, I'd recommend, uh, you know, doing some moderate intensity type cardio, treadmill, elliptical, bike, walking, whatever it is you really enjoy that you can do while you're multitasking. So, you know, whether that's catching up on a podcast, watching TV, doing the things uh, that you do, you're going to do anyway on conference calls, Zoom homebrew club meetings, whatever. Um, you can even surf the web if you get the right sort of laptop uh, set up for your uh, exercise equipment. And the third thing that works really well is high intensity interval training. And I don't want to get too much into this, but you know, these are those boot camp type workouts that are short, but not very sweet, you know, 15 minutes long, but you go full out for one minute, followed by a minute of recovery. Um, you know, and they say that this keeps your fat burning going for up to 24 hours after the workout. This is, you're going to be huffing and puffing and, you know, 
feeling like you want to throw up. So um, be be careful. Talk to your doctor before doing this. Um, and then, you know, the single best exercise I found for this for me is, is kettlebells. Um, but a word of caution here too: make sure you go learn how to do these right. You can easily hurt your back um, if you don't if you're doing them wrong. Other exercise, you know, burpees, jump squats, sprints, lunges, all those things you see doing um, on those torture videos. Um, I use ice hockey for this now. You know, we go one to two minute shifts and then I get off the ice and breathe really hard for another minute before I have to go back on. Some exercises I do are just, you know, pure vanity. They're, they're targeted at a spe specific body part, but, you know, just trying to make your arms look better or whatever. It's I don't need to be able to lift more weights towards my face, but, you know, Doing these right gives you a little bit more definition, and you know, I guess that's part of the whole idea too. Um, Push-ups are another good exercise, help tone things up. This one here, the myotatic crunch over the top of this thing's called a Bosu ball. It's like a half yoga ball, um, and I hate these. I absolutely hate these things, but um, they're like twice as effective as crunches at kind of revealing what's underneath uh, your skin, um, and so they're effective. Um, People have also uh, said that building muscle helps, uh, you know, helps you burn um, fat in the times when you're not exercising. So, you know, you can do some bodybuilding, lift some resistance training. And I'd also recommend taking photos of yourself for your own private collection and hide them away well every five pounds as you're losing weight. Um, it, it will be a tremendous motivator later on as you, you know, start to stall out or whatever. You can look back to where you started from and really um, see where you're at. I'm going to share some things that took me a year to learn. Um, uh, like I mentioned, some of these which surprised me. Um, and I, and um, let me see. Your, ta your tastes are going to change over time. Um, I love veggies now. Some things that uh, used to seem bland now seem sweet to me. Uh, another thing it's important to notice, and you probably ha instinctively know this, but you know our, our human instincts are working against us in the present day. You know we're no longer having to uh, work so hard for our food. Uh, so we instinctively sort of crave calorically dense foods, um, especially when there's combinations of, you know, salt, fat, and sweet. Oh, boy, we love those. Um, and we do that because, you know, it, it, that would enable us to build up fat stores so we could survive through some period of scarcity um, in, in the past. Uh, but your body is regularly switching back and forth between fat burning mode and fat storage mode. And there's probably somewhere in between. But being aware of which mode you're in is kind of the key to you know, weight loss and fat burning. Um, and I guess the important note here is that, you know, so this gaining weight is, is your body's, you know, perfectly normal response to this weird period in human history where, you know, cheap, you know, calorically dense foods are available everywhere we go. Um, we don't have the time to plan for or shop or, or, you know, um, get quality ingredients or, or make healthy food. So it's, your body gaining weight is, is a perfectly normal response to all of that. But I also found that the way that you eat and drink can affect you know, your uh, weight gain or loss, as well as what it is that you're eating or drinking, you know, the timing. Um, we find that the sharper the spike in your blood sugar curve, the further your body will go in the fat storage mode and the more fat you'll put away for future. Um, Another one. So this is this is a fun one. I always wondered why, you know, pure distilled spirits uh, like vodka had calories. I just I couldn't figure it out. You know, I, there's no sugar in there. Right. There's no protein or fat. And so what's the story? Well, I'll tell you here in a second. And the answer surprised me. Another note, as you do lose weight, your tolerance will decrease. So just be prepared for that. Um, you'd be a lightweight after uh, losing a few pounds. You just don't have as much to absorb it. OK, so let's talk about how a little bit more detail on each of these things and tie it into home brewing. Um, caloric density. Uh, it's just a measure of the number of calories in any given, you know, unit of food, whether that's a pound or a bottle of beer. Um, in nutrition literature, they talk about per 100 gram serving. In the food world, the lowest caloric densities are typically found in the above ground veggies, uh, while fats and oils tend to be some of the highest caloric density foods. So that's why you can power a car with vegetable oil if you have the right technology. Um, but here's a key concept uh, of this entire presentation is if you're able to modify your diet so that you're eating lower caloric density foods, um, you'll find that you feel full and satisfied while consuming fewer calories overall. 
And so I think that's really a key message here. And there's entire wellness books and diet books built around that idea for really good reason. And the same idea of caloric density applies to beer or other drinks. So there's definitely a time and a place for those rich, boozy beers. Um, I love a Scotch ale or Belgian dark strong. But if you can learn to appreciate the subtle characteristics of the lower caloric density beers, you can still be satisfied while minimizing the overall health impact. So in homebrewing, you know, caloric density in your beer depends mainly on the um, original gravity of the wort, which is just amount, you know, a measure of the amount of sugar that's dissolved in the water. Of course, some sugar gets converted to alcohol, which has some calories. Some typically remains as residual sugars. So you'll find that beers with lower OG have lower caloric density um, than bigger, higher OG beers, and um, you know, vice versa. It's important to know too if there's any sugar that's added to the finished product, like back sweetening of ciders or meads, um, or you know, even some rums and whiskeys add a lot of sugar after distillation. So, you know, a, a friend's wife in my homebrew club likes to remind him at the neighborhood uh, happy hours that every beer is a cupcake. And a typical cupcake, you know, is about 130 calories. So, you know, that IPA there that we're talking about, yeah, it's more like two cupcakes. So hopefully I didn't just ruin beer and cupcakes for you guys, but it's useful metaphor. And hopefully you'll keep that in mind as you move forward. And you can see there's clearly a trade-off here between uh, ABV and calories. It's not a, you know, coincidence. Um, and I probably shouldn't give this tip, but, you know, there's probably some folks on here that uh, are looking for the biggest bang for their you know, biggest ABV bang for their calories. Um, and somebody has created this uh, pretty informative website um, with a terrible, terrible name called Get Drunk, Not Fat, that will help educate you on that. And you're welcome. So let's talk a little bit about session beers. We'll bring this uh, concept of uh, caloric density into session beers. And you guys know, pretty much have concepts of what these are. They're, you know, tend to be a uh, wide range of styles and colors, you know, restrained hop bitterness, um, generally less than 5% alcohol. Real keys to the style are balance, being easy on your palate, uh, being highly drinkable. Um, I learned a long time ago that my drinking arm only goes uh, one speed regardless of what's in my glass. So sort of as a self-defense mechanism, I learned to appreciate session beers early on. Uh, you know, American lager, session IPA, international lager. Okay, so there's lots of session beers to, that you can choose from. Sip them slow, enjoy the, the flavors, and have a couple. All right. I, I know, realize that this presentation can't go much depth into um, brewing session beers, but suffice to say, um, if you can get Jennifer Talley's book, she covers it all. She's been making these beers for years and winning awards at GABF. Um, use good ingredients, there's nowhere to hide. A couple of quick tips though. Um, you can use a no sparge mash for these, which seems to preserve um, some of the multi flavors without any of the risk of astringency from sparging a, you know, such a small amount of grain. And mash a little higher in order to uh, keep some of those extra long chain sugars in the uh, in the final beers, preserve some body. All right, I apologize. I got to click through some of these really fast. But uh, blood sugar curves, I've mentioned it a few times. This is an important concept to understand and lots of different ways that you can game this system in order to uh, you know achieve your goals more easily. Um, particularly, you know, not eating dessert first and spiking your blood sugar at the outset of a meal and maybe avoiding those basket of nacho or the uh, tortilla chips that used to be my favorite thing on earth. When did they get to this one? So what about alcohol? So distilled spirits, you know, of course have calories, but what's with that? You know, there's no fat, there's no carbs, you know, there may not be any protein in there. Turns out alcohol is a fourth macronutrient. So we don't talk about this very much, but right along with protein, carbs, and fat, um, but because it's not essential for human survival, um, it's rarely discussed in the uh, nutrition literature. Um, in fact, it contains seven grams of alcohol per serving. So, you know, it's right up there with uh, fats in terms of um, the number of, the, or the amount of calories in it. Um, and also your alcohol or your body sees alcohol as a poison. So it ends up, you know, metabolizing that first. It shuts down any fat burning mode you might have going. So if you wondered if it might be fun to, you know, uh, drink while you, before you exercise, well, it might be a little bit more fun, but it won't be uh, effective for your fat burning um, until the alcohol is out of your system and you might fall down. So be careful.
I've talked about most of my approach here. I think the only thing that's really new on this slide is talking about how I'm a little extra good on Monday and Tuesday, and I'm lucky to have a partner who helps me with that. Um, but we balance out the splurges of the weekend by, um, you know, being meatless Monday and, you know, basically not drinking on Monday and Tuesday. So um, I typically still fast. Um, I still track my weight. I play ice hockey once a week, and I'm trying to get away from just being mindful during my meditation sessions now and trying to build that into, um, you know, kind of the overall day. Keep some good snacks on hand. Keep yourself out of trouble. Acknowledging, though, I, I still have some some issues where I struggle there. You know, things get stressful. When I get a buzz on, you know, all of a sudden the uh, food decisions go out the window. I never want to miss out on somebody's homemade, you know, baked goods. Traveling's tough. Um, so all these things can be complicating. Of course, working from home, you know, the fridge is right down the hall. I go to fill my water up at the fridge. So, you know, it's a problem. <laughs> uh, mindful drinking, you know, something to keep in mind is always ask yourself before your next beer, will this beer serve me? Is it going to enhance my situation with my friends? Or is this now just pushing me beyond where I'm really going to have more of a good time because of this beer? And if that's the answer, you know, switch to a LaCroix or, a, you know, diet soda or something. So make it a no. Okay, some quick challenges to you guys. So try Headspace, get a good scale. If you want to do this, commit to balancing out those splurges, learn to brew those session beers, bring them to me to try. And I want to mention, you know, in Quaff a few years back, we even did a weight loss challenge where 14 of us got together. We did weigh-ins over a period of four months. We did hikes together. Um, and the group of, you know, 14 ended up losing about 84 pounds total. And everybody pitched in like a $20 gift card or a, a prize of some sort to this pool of prizes. And the, the winner took away a really nice prize. So something you guys may want to consider. Okay, so yeah, I apologize. We had to go through those things really fast at the end there. But um, if anybody's interested in, you know, talking about this more, I want to make sure we continue the conversation after today. If anybody wants to maybe have this a topic at one of your homebrew club meetings, um, you know, we can certainly talk about doing that, you know, get in touch by email there. I want to give huge thanks to Travis for sharing this information, sharing his experience. Also, huge thanks to the American Homebrewers Association for allowing Chop and Brew to borrow and basically reprint the seminar. Become an AHA member by going to homebrewersassociation.org and enjoy an archive of over 450 technical, historical, and cultural presentations from past HomebrewCon conferences. In addition to their many beer recipes that include gluten-free and non-alcohol resources, the AHA also offers insights and recipes for all things fermentation, from making your own sourdough and fermented pepper sauces to kombucha. Again, if you heard something in this presentation that resonates with you, that encourages you to make small or large changes in your life, please don't just take it from two random home brewers. Go to your doctor, go to a dietitian, find a professional to help you build a plan that you can stick to, rely on, but also give yourself a little grace, y'all. This much, man, not this much. Give yourself this much grace, because it's hard and it's difficult and it's worth it. Chop for chop, brew for brew, hack for hack, y'all. <laughs>